Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for another edition of our fortnightly IRENA Insight webinar series. My name is Arina Anisie, and I'm from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn, Germany. For those of you who are joining for the first time, let me introduce you to you IRENA and our webinar series. IRENA is an intergovernmental organization with currently 167 member countries and another 17 countries in their accession process. What do we do? We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as the principal platform for international cooperation, a center of excellence and the repository of policy, technology, resource and financial knowledge on renewable energy. And since our analytical workshop and our engagement with our member generates a lot of valuable insights, we are constantly looking for more ways to share insights with you, these insights with you. So that's why we launched this webinar series and we run this series every other week, usually on Tuesday. We started in January 2020 and so far we organized over 30 webinars. You can check them all on our IRENA events website. They are recorded and, uh, and uh, they are posted there always. This one as well, you will find it after, after today uh, on IRENA website. There are many other long deep dive webinars out there. We are aware of that, but here we aim to keep these webinars very short. They last approximately 30 minutes. Clearly, we cannot cover everything, but the idea is to give you enough to decide whether you want to delve deeper into the topic. And we signpost in our presentations further resources of more in-depth information to help you to do that. Next slide, please. So today, while you enjoy your coffee, tea or bagel, in the next 30 minutes or so, we will hear from Martina Lyons. If you have listening before the IRENA Insight webinar, you already know Martina. She's an associate program officer in the innovation and end use sectors team at IRENA. Her work fo focuses on pathway to decarbonize hard to abate industry sector. Today, she will share with us key takeaways from, from the recent annual IRENA report, Reaching Zero with Renewables, Capturing Carbon, which uh, she is one of the, of the main authors as well of this report. So um, she will share with you all the important key insights. But before I hand over to the microphone to Martina to hear uh, the presentation, just very briefly, a few usual housekeeping items, uh, which you certainly are all aware of from the other online events. But just to let you know, we are recording the webinar and the recordings and slides will be available or on IRENA's events website. You are all on mute. If, if we have questions for us, please use the question functions in, uh, in the platform. And don't forget to give us your feedback in the short survey, which you, you will, be, will be available and you'll receive it after the webinar. So, Without any further ado, let me welcome Martina. Martina, over to you. Thank you, Arina, for introduction and hello, and thank you um, again, everyone, for joining us today. In this presentation, I will highlight just a few insights from our latest report, but the report includes many more detailed information and analysis. And I invite you to like a look at the report, which is available on our website, free of charge. Next slide, please. So, we are seeing increasing calls for carbon neutrality by 2050 by public and private players. Under current NDCs, estimates of the global emissions would lead to global greenhouse gas emissions of 52 to 58 gigatons of CO2 in 2030. Just for your reference, we are currently already at around 32 gigatons of CO2. These pathways would not limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. The current decade is therefore critical for reducing global emissions and to meet our climate goals. Yet, emissions continue to increase. Between 2014 and 2019, energy-related CO2 emissions increased 1.3% annually on average. 2020 was an outlier due to COVID, but 2021 we saw a massive rebound. So to hold the line at 1.5 degrees means we need to both reach net zero emissions by 2050 and ensure a rapid decline in emissions which needs to begin now. So what is needed? By 2030, renewable power should reach 10,700 gigawatts globally, which is four-fold increase from 2020. We need upgrade modernization and expansion of infrastructure, and we need policies and financial instruments to, to support these technological avenues. However, 
The scale of the challenge, the relatively limited time available, the legacy of systems built around fossil fuel use, and the complexity of some industrial processes mean that even a very aggressive ramping up of renewables will not be sufficient to address all the emissions. And as you can see on the slide, some fossil fuel use will remain in 2050, and some industrial processes will produce CO2 emissions, irrespective of their energy source, such as cement. Therefore, there is a targeted role for a combination of carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and utilization, and carbon removal uh, technologies in industry processes. Next slide, please. So over 90% of the solutions for net zero in 2050 involve renewables. And here I included also bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage bags. In residual use of fossil fuels and some industrial processes, Decarbonization efforts may require CCS and CO2 removal technologies and measures. And a small caveat, we, when I will talk about CO2 removal, in our IRENA scenario, we always refer to BECS. So DAX is not included. Next slide, please. So let's take it step by step. We start with the CCS and CCU. Under IRENA 1.5 degree scenario, CCS and CCU for fossil fuel and process emissions in the industry need to be scaled up to reach 3.4 gigatons of CO2 per year by 2050. And this would require a cumulative investment of around 0.9 trillion American dollars between now and 2050. CCS and CCU are limited to the most essential applications in our scenario, with 2.3 gigatons per year applied to cement, chemicals, iron and steel sectors, and 1.1 gigaton per year of CO2 applied to production of blue hydrogen from natural gas with CCS. Just for a context, this equals to approximately 30% of the total hydrogen supply. We do not foresee CCS with power plants, and I will touch upon that on our later slides. Next slide, please. Net zero pathways rely on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and partial utilization but these are currently unproven in most contexts. It, it requires both a scaling up of CCS deployment as such and strategies to ensure sufficient, sustainable and sustainable biomass feedstock supplies. These technologies can in principle be utilized in a range of processes, but the optimum application requires a more detailed investigation uh, of costs, logistics, sustainable biomass supply chain, and this will be highly context and country specific. Our assessment showed that there is a potential of carbon capture and storage coupled with biomass of over 10 gigaton of CO2 per year by 2050. Of that, our, of that potential, our scenario assumes 44% to be actually captured and stored. This would require approximately 40 to 50 exajoules of biomass, which represent a third of total biomass used in energy systems. The similar scenario to remove 5 gigaton per year of CO2 by 2050 with bags was also assumed by IPCC 6 assessment working group 1 report which was published last summer. Capturing and storing 4.5 gigaton per year of CO2 by 2050 would require cumulative investment of more than 1.1 trillion American dollars between now and 2050. And then we also look at the most significant opportunities for bags, and we saw them in cement kilns with biomass providing the fuel, in chemical plant with biomass as the feedstock, biogas upgrading where the fraction of CO2, fraction of biogas is separated for the production of biomethane, in iron and steel production, in blast furnaces for iron production, we, uh, where charcoal can be used both as a fuel and also reducing agent. However, in our scenario by 2050, the role of BEX in iron and steel is rather low because our scenario assumes a nearly complete transition away from blast furnaces by then. And then in power and heat generation with biomass providing some or all of the fuel using either wood pellets, sugarcane, bagasse, or municipal solid waste. In the next decade, in the sorry, in the past decade, a small number of coal power plants have been converted into 100% biomass power plants or are in the process of doing so. And only one fully converted power plant, which is in which is drugs in the UK, has publicly announced plans to add CCS. 
two drugs units, each rated circa at circa 660 megawatt, would capture approximately four megaton of CO2 per year. To put it in perspective, if we aim to capture 4.5 gigaton per year through BEX, we would require over 1,100 such units around the world or equivalent. And most BEX applications will be much smaller than this. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, in our 1.5 degree scenarios, we do not assume DAX. Direct air capture and storage and utilization technologies are in the early stages of development and a long way from reaching a gigaton scales needed to be impactful. Current operating commercial plants capture a negligible amount of CO2, which is approximately 0.9 kiloton per year. And one other plant under development would, would add additional 21 kiloton per year of CO2 capture. So according to this early experience, projects face relatively high energy, water, and land requirements, but importantly, they offer flexibility in terms of their location. The technology is comparatively, at this stage, more expensive with the frequently, most frequently used a quoted estimate between 600 and 900 uh, American dollars per ton of CO2 avoided. However, newer studies, newer studies estimate lower costs in the range between 94 to 232 dollars per ton of CO2. However, we, will, we are still waiting for this to be demonstrated. We are currently seeing large final, uh, financial commitments to speed up their deployment, which if successful in driving the scale, would allow DAX to offset some of the needs for BEX and also allow to capture historical emissions elsewhere. Next slide, please. So up to now, we were talking about where should we get? But in reality, progress in scaling up CCS technologies in past two decades has been slow. CO2 capture capacities have doubled in the past decade, two decades, uh, no, in one decade, but still reach only 0.04 gigaton of CO2 globally. To put this number in the, in the context, this is less than 0.1% of global energy and process-related emissions right now. This image shows commercial plants in different stages of development, and we can see in green a lot of new projects. Many were actually added in the last one to two years. So there is a growing momentum and we will be looking at this much closer. Next slide, please. In addition to commercial plants, there are also many more pilot and demonstration projects, mostly in the industry sector. They're testing, demonstrating various capture technologies, but also transportation and injection to underground storage. Still, the majority we see in CCS and CCU, but increasingly followed by BEX and DAX. Next slide, please. We also compare the use of renewables versus CCS across sectors. And uh, from these graphs, you can see that in many contexts, renewables outcompete CCS on cost per ton of CO2 and on sustainability grounds. And in other contexts, renewables and CCS, CCU, and CDR are, more, are rather complementary. At current costs, fossil fuel power plants with CCS cannot compete with renewable power. Uh, the levelized cost of electricity from this plant with a 90% capture rate is higher than the equivalent plant without CCS, given the higher capital costs, OPEX, and energy penalty of CCS. Future long-term cost reduction in CCS for power production are likely, but the lack of momentum to date makes the near and medium term CCS cost reduction potential uncertain. Given that renewable power production continues to be added at record capacity and costs continue to fall rapidly, the gap between CCS and renewable power is unlikely to narrow quickly. And for fossil fuel power production with CCS, it is unlikely to be deployed before we see significant shares of renewables with storage deployed. This will mean very few plants will achieve high load factors, as they will have to flex to accommodate solar and wind generation, which will further impact their economics. But we do see CCS as economically justifiable per ton of CO2 for the production of ammonia, methanol, cement, and iron and steel. Next slide, please. Cost is a crucial factor in decisions of future role of these technologies. 
CCS proponents claim significant potential for learning through uh, learning effects through learning by doing and learning by innovating and project significant cost reduction going forward. It is not possible to validate such claims, but given the limited deployment to date and many cost reduction drivers, cost reduction, cost reduction through learning and innovating and economies of scale is likely. However, to what extent it remains uh, highly uncertain. From the literature review, cost estimates, which included also transport and storage of the most mature technologies per application, as you can see on these slides, range between 22 and 225 American dollars per ton of CO2. As the CCS, CCU and BEX plans do not bring directly commercial benefits to investors and require high CAPEX and OPEX, financial incentives are crucial for the deployment. And this could be achieved by direct financial support and also by indirectly through emission standards, carbon taxes and prices to create the business case. Next slide, please. This slide is just to briefly outline that our report discuss the whole value chain. We looked at different captured technologies in power sector, natural uh, gas processing and cement, iron and steel and chemicals, either using fossil fuels or biomass, mostly co-firing. We also look at different capture rates of different technologies, energy penalty, capex of newly built and refurbished plants, and also at avoided costs. We also discussed transport mode storage and utilization. Next slide, please. But because utilization is li la lately getting traction, let me just briefly discuss just this part of the topic. According to 1.5 degree scenarios, scenario, utilization has a role in a net zero pathway, but should be limited to applications that do not lead to later release of CO2 back to the atmosphere. Utilization, however, improves economic feasibility of CO2 capture by create, creating revenue stream. And importantly, it also compensates for a lack of readily available and accessible CO2 storage sites and transportation. CCU entails a suite of technologies and applications. CO2 fu to fuels, this includes production of energy vectors such as syngas, hydrogen, renewable methanol, and so on. But except of hydrogen, all these technologies are in early stages of development. Another application is enhanced commodity production, where CO2 is used to produce certain goods such as urea or fertilizers, and they are mature technologies. Another application is enhanced hydrocarbon recovery. This includes technologies that use CO2 as a working fluid to increase recovery of hydrocarbons oil recovery, gas recovery, or bed, coal bed methanol. EOR is a much mature technology, but uh, gas recovery and coal bed methanol are in the early demonstration stages. There is also an opportunity to utilize CO2 in enhanced geothermal system, but still also more at the demonstration stage. And another application is CO2 mineralization. This is used to produce cement tissues and building materials. But none of these technologies are currently mature and all require additional RD&D funding and efforts. And last application, uh, definitely not the least, is the production of chemicals and pharmaceuticals. A lot of these applications are mature, but many are still emerging, such as production of polymers. There are also several considerations for the scale up of CCU. First is the maturation of technologies. As I said, some still requires financial and policy support, including RD&D funding and incentive to actually in involve the private sector. Second, we need proximity of location between capture and utilization plans. And we do already see such example of the cooperation between chemical sector and iron seal sector, for example. And third, potential commercial market. We consulted several studies that uh, have estimated potential demand for CO2 in different applications. So for the CO2 as fuel, the potential uh, demand is the highest and is over 1.2 gigatons of uh, CO2 per year. For CO2 uh, mineralization, this amounts up to 630 megatons of CO2 per year. For enhanced commodity production, the potential is much lower and amounts to up to 65 megaton per year and the production of chemical is up to 37 megaton of CO2 but we are seeing a lot of changes so this might also change next slide please and one more consideration as it is difficult to trace 
CO2 across multiple end uses, CCU poses questions about the long-term consequences when reaching zero, or what is the time scale of the product to release CO2. So for the CCU to be a viable strategy, the short term, CO2 should be utilizing products that lock in CO2 emissions for an extended period of time, and also consider the li likelihood of CO2 release. The example are cementitious and other building materials, the use of CO2 for enhanced fuel recovery, while the rest uh, of the CO2, where the rest of the CO2 is stored uh, long term. While plastic uh, lock in uh, the CO2 for extended period, they will detrimentally affect the environment if plastic pollution is not managed well. Further skepticism about locking effects is prevalent in chemicals, fertilizers, and fuels where it is known that CO2 emissions are emitted back to the atmosphere within days or weeks. And next slide, the last slide, please. I will close this presentation outlining policy messages. Accelerated action on multiple fronts is needed, including many more projects in 2020s, if CO2 capture is to play a sufficient role in 20, by 2050. CCS, CCU, and CDR technologies are established, but they are not widely deployed. And the pace of progress in the development and deployment has been very slow, with many plants falling. There are some signs that the pace may pick up, driven by the stronger policy signals provided by the increasing amounts of ambitions for deep decarbonization. But the lessons of the so slow progress today need to be learned. These technologies are complex to deploy, they're capex and opex uh, intensive, and they increase risk and cost of the project, mostly without direct benefits to their investors. Private sector alone cannot uh, or will be unlikely to drive the accelerated pace, pace uh, of progress needed without much stronger incentives. To adequately scale the technologies will entail entail numerous conditions. It will include stable and well-functioning R&D uh, programs, including support for demonstration, first of a kind and commercial projects, robust life cycle analysis, enabling regulatory frameworks and standards, technology promoting institution, financial incentives, the active promotion of CCS and CCU technologies to the public. And in the case of bioenergy coupled with with carbon capture and storage and utilization sufficient sustainably sourced biomass feedstock. Some countries and regions such as Australia, Canada, China, Norway, US, UK and Europe have invested in CCS over the past two decades, including both rd and funding and some incentive for CCS deployment and have started characterizing commercially viable storage sites. Other countries are beginning to take an interest and put support mechanism in place but there is still a large gap in infrastructure, regulatory, and financial landscape. International cooperation will be therefore an important enabler in leveraging national uh, efforts, sending consistent signals to investors, promoting widespread sharing of experience and lessons learned from early deployment. And such cooperation much, must reach beyond the front-running countries and ensure that all countries have the knowledge and capacity to plan for the adoption of emerging technologies. So setting a clear, feasible, but ambitious national and in international goals can be a powerful tool for building consensus and informing shared action plans. So that's for all from me. Thank you for your attention and I look forward for your questions. Thank you very, very much, Martina. That was a very insightful presentation. And thank you to our audience for posing and asking so many questions. Uh, we promised you a short 30 minutes webinar, so we will try to keep our promise. And we have just six minutes for, for answering a question. But the good news is that I see many of the questions that are uh, already in our uh, chat have been more or less answered as we went to, through the presentation. One was uh, on policies that uh, I think the last slide uh, from Martina's presentation uh, uh, answered the, the question on policy. Um, I see a, an interesting question here, just to clarify, uh, someone is asking uh, if you can please explain the difference between uh, carbon reduction and carbon removal uh, technologies. Thank you for this question indeed. When addressing CO2 emissions, there is often conflation between reduction, the concept of reduction and uh, removal. 
Both concepts involve capturing carbon dioxide, but the categorization uh, depends on the source of CO2. And this is very important for decision making, making in the concept or a very constrained uh, carbon budgets. They share uh, some common elements, but their role and their impact on net emissions of CO2 vary. So CO2 emission reduction um, refers to situation in which CO2 is a white waste uh, waste gas from burning fossil fuel or from industrial processes and it is directly captured from point sources and then it is stored long term. This CO2 would otherwise be emitted to the atmosphere. In this case the source of CO2 is fossil fuels. Emission reduction technologies are relevant to fossil fuel use in industrial processes for hydrogen production or power generation. Um, and CCS and CCU are the example of carbon emission reduction. For the carbon budget constraint perspective, what is important is that CO2 emission reduction processes can reduce new emissions, but they do not lead to a net reduction in CO2 in atmosphere. On the other hand, we have CO2 emission removal, which refers to a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, which is then stored long term. And this leads to a net reduction of CO2 in the natural environment. So the source of CO2 in this case is the atmosphere. And these carbon removal measures involve extracting CO2 directly from the atmosphere or indirectly via sustainable uh, growth and use of biomass. In the energy system context, the principal ways of doing so are the use of biomass with CCS bags and also these direct air capture and storage ducts. But there are also other like reforestation, afforestation, and so on. And what is important here is that CO2 removal processes can lead to a net reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere. But the small caveat, the context matters too, because if the biomass is not, it's not sustainably sourced, or the direct air capture is powered by fossil fuels, and if the capture CO2 is used to produce product that later release CO2, it may not result in a net reduction of emissions. Thank you. So this is all for me. Yes, very clear. Uh, thank you very much. We received a lot of questions. Um, let's take one last one. Um, we got several questions on storage, so I tried to uh, bundle some of uh, the issues together. Can you please, Martina, explain, um, do we have enough storage place? Is it safe? Uh, what is more promising for emitters? Is it CCU or CCS? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this topic of storage? That... Yes. Thank you for, for all this question. And I will actually start from, from the last part. So uh, CCU versus CCS. And I would say that it all depends. Um, it is a mixture of opportunities and availabilities. And we can also discuss it from the perspective of short and long-term solutions. So CCU creates an opportunity for revenue. And fuels and mentioned during the presentation will be in high demand. Except hydrogen, however, these technologies are not mature. Even though we do see chemical companies already working with industry, where they built utilization plants right next to CO2 capture to use that CO2. Um, I think we will keep seeing a lot of such development uh, in, the in the near future, and we might be surprised how fast the sector moves ahead. And, and it will be also cheaper unless the government will mandate storage or will in some ways uh, calculate CO2, including uh, realizing the the, the CO2 release from the products in their accounting. On the other hand, CCS, injecting and storing CCS, a CO2, sorry, is not new and it's also not emerging technology. It's already viable and we are already storing more than one megaton of, of CO2 per year. Knowledge and experience um, has improved a lot in terms of how CO2 behaves in different geological uh, formations and also how it interacts interacts with water, minerals, and so on. But what is missing are the policy and regulatory frameworks to store CO2 at gigaton levels, and also an understanding on, of costs and their categorization across, uh, across project phases. So from site screening, site selection, 
permitting, construction, operation, but also post injection, which is monitoring and evaluation and closure. Uh, so one of the ways to share and increase confidence would be to do it through publicly available sources to allow for more direct comparison, which is currently missing. It is also important to differentiate uh, between two most, uh, most mature technologies, enhanced oil recovery and cell information. Uh, they will play or the how we will or whether they will play a role is very geographically um, dependent and also depends on available existing infrastructure for both storage and transport. When currently available geological storage and transport are limited just to a handful of countries. And we have the US and North Sea, but the majority of countries do not have an infrastructure. And changing that will take a decade as making storage operational requires a lot of work. So to answer if it's safe, there have been some discussion about the leakage of CO2 from reservoir, where is it stored? There were risk assessments for those projects and the leakage was considered as the lowest risk. CO2, because CO2 is stored under a cup rock at the depths beyond 200 meters, which is dense, which makes it dense as high pressure restricts the movement. So catastrophic damage due to CO2 leakage have not yet materialized, but we also nevertheless uh, will need to continuously monitor it and to see. And to answer whether uh, there is enough storage, so we, in theory, we do have enough uh, storage space. In 2020, the CO2 storage resource catalog mapped storage resources around the globe and they came up with more than 12,000 gigatons of potential unverified CO2 storage resources all over the world. Uh, out of these, around 400 gigatons are now verified storage places. And over the next five years, a major effort, effort should be to technically assess every of those storage places. However, not all countries allow geological storage. Some introduce a permanent ban and only make exception for research purposes. Other prohibited it uh, temporarily and they're waiting for more information to come to establish the risks. For example, according to 2019 report from the European Commission, 80% of cell information in the EU are situated in countries with CO2 storage bans. So to answer the, the, all these questions, it's always, it's complex. It all depends country by country, context by context. So I hope it, uh, it helps. Thank you, Martina. We have received so many questions. I see people are interested to know more about costs, about carbon budget. There are also some regional questions about these technologies and their use in Middle East, in Africa. All very interesting questions. I apologize. We apologize in advance now for, for not being able to address all of that. But uh, please take a look on our uh, uh, report on, on that. And I'm sure much more information would be much more questions will be answered in the report and otherwise also please feel free to to contact us and to continue the conversation bilaterally unfortunately now our 30 minutes it uh, came to an end so i would like to thank you martina for your time and for sharing with us these key insights from uh, your latest report and uh, as well thank you very much all of you for joining today for listening and for all our questions we we hope you learned something new uh, today what comes next uh, for our IRENA Insights webinar? Well, we are um, uh, already planning a, a series of webinar in, in the next weeks. On 8th of February, you will hear about decarbonization of cities and sector, uh, coupling and facilitating the integration of uh, variable renewable energy in cities. Uh, then in two weeks, we will have another webinar about decarbonizing shipping and uh, in another two weeks, you will hear more about patents and standards and our Inspire platform. All this information, you'll find them on the link uh, on our invites page. The link is it's on the screen. And uh, the registrations uh, for all uh, the upcoming ones are already open. So uh, please feel free to register and we look forward to seeing you again. That's all from us today. Have a great uh, rest of the day. Goodbye and see you soon. Thank you very much and see you soon.
Bye bye. Bye bye.